I'll take maybe about, uh, I don't know, 50 minutes or something to talk about uh, Vision Zero, which is the subject here. Um, uh, there's something I need to say first, and that's um, I prepared this presentation at the end of last week, um, and I was sitting uh, reviewing it at the weekend and doing what I think most people in Sweden were doing at the time, and that was listening to the news because there had been this uh, terrorist attack that I guess you've heard about. Um, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because that's it's really not the forum for it, but it was really hard to talk about um, traffic safety in our city without acknowledging the fact that four people lost their lives on, on our busiest uh, pedestrian street last week. Um, like I said, I don't want to say any more about it. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. I've changed some things in my presentation because of it, so if I lose track a little bit at some point, that, that that's an explanation for that. Um, I'm going to try and cover these four themes more or less. I'll talk a bit about the origins of Vision Zero in Sweden. Uh, Sweden was the first country to adopt uh, Vision Zero, or the first jurisdiction, I should say, to adopt Vision Zero, um, how it came about, what it means, uh, something about why it's a little bit controversial sometimes. Um, I'm going to talk quite a bit about data, um, and I'm sorry for people who don't like that kind of thing, but there's going to be a lot of graphs. It's fine. We'll get through that together. It'll be good. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, a lot about speed because it's a really important part of our Vision Zero work and I will then uh, finish off with some kind of more practical what Vision Zero actually looks like on the ground, um, what kind of measures we're, we're, we're carrying out and, and, and what that looks like in, in reality. So I hope that works for everyone. Um, a little uh, word about language. Um, in Swedish we use this word olika. And olika is uh, it's kind of hard to translate but it means if I say that I am unhappy I would say I am olicklig. So it means misfortune, it means unhappiness, it means sorrow, but it also means accident. And I know there's a, a discussion around the word accident and whether we should use accident or crash or collision. Um, because we generally translate all liquor directly to accident in Swedish or, or in English, I'm probably going to use the word accident. I'm not taking any kind of uh, position in that discussion, uh, but I just want you to know it's a kind of hygiene factor at the beginning. If I use the word accident and when I'm using the word accident, it's because that's the formal translation we use in, in Swedish. Um, working with uh, traffic safety is uh, nothing new in Sweden. It's not new in any other country either. This is uh, actually an image from a, a, a book I found in our archive. Um, it's a, a map showing where traffic uh, accidents or collisions took place on the streets of Stockholm in 1934. Probably not many of those were with cars. I'm guessing it's with uh, bicycles and trams and uh, uh, horse-drawn vehicles and some trucks and stuff, but it's uh, if I was to show you, and I will later, um, a, a similar image from today's uh, um, transportation system, you'll see that most of our collisions, most of our incidents are happening at more or less the same kinds of locations. So around this time from the 1930s, 1940s onwards, um, what was happening was that traffic was increasing, cars were becoming more, uh, uh, were becoming more, um, more, uh, um, more available to, to ordinary people. And what was happening was the, uh, the, the the death rate, the number of people being killed and injured on our roads was actually increasing at a faster rate than that, quite a considerably faster rate if you look at this uh, this diagram by, uh, starting in 1950. Uh, but the, um, so these, these accident rates were, were increasing and kind of uh, becoming a really big problem and uh, people were wondering what can we do about this, but a lot of people were kind of thinking there's nothing to do about it. It was it was, it was was seen very much as uh, the cost of doing business, more or less. We think cars are good. We think accessibility is good. It has this nasty side effect that a lot of people are dying, but eh, what can you do, kind of? Um, and that uh, persisted, more or less, until this, uh, we can't just pinpoint a year. We can actually pinpoint a day when uh, Sweden's attitude to traffic safety can change quite considerably. And it's this day, it's the 3rd of uh, September 1967, so we're coming up to a, a, a 50th, 50th, is it 50th? Yes. 50th anniversary of, uh, of this, uh, the, later this year. What happened on the 3rd of September 1967 was that Sweden switched from driving on the left of the road, as they, we still do in the UK and in Ireland and other countries, to switching on the right, to, to driving on the right, I beg your pardon happened at uh, five o'clock on a Sunday morning. Um, this is an image from um, one of the main high streets in Stockholm at the time. Uh, obviously, lots of people came out to look at this because it was a lot of fun. Um, no ordinary uh, vehicles were allowed onto the road. It was police vehicles, it's taxis, it's delivery vehicles. And everyone was told to stop at uh, one minute to five, and then at five o'clock, orderly, make your way to the other side of the road. 
obviously there have been uh, years of increasing uh, traffic violence and, and, and uh, death on the road and a lot of people were very concerned that uh, um, when this uh, change was made people would be very confused, nobody would understand um, there were reports in newspapers of, of fears of carnage on the road that lots and lots of people were going to die, that the traffic uh, injury rate was going to increase quite considerably. So there was a lot of work was done around education, um, around enforcement, a lot of new speed limits were introduced, um, uh, a lot of new safety measures were put in the streets, uh, the signs were improved massively, um, kind of uh, in particular new pedestrian crossings were introduced, um, a lot of new kind of both physical infrastructure but also uh, enforcement and education was uh, was done around this and for about a year the police were, were much more active on the streets uh, enforcing uh, uh, vehicle regulations there was a whole uh, fleet of um, traffic leaders or traffic leaders basically if we translate directly to English on the streets during this time so this uh, this fear of a, a huge increase in traffic incidents or traffic deaths it didn't occur in fact quite the opposite happened there's quite a dramatic fall in uh, in uh, injury rates, in, uh, in, in particular in deaths, particularly in this year. And it was just in this year because the following year, when uh, the education stopped, when the, um, the, um, the 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 enforcement was not quite as effective, when there wasn't quite as many police people around, when people weren't taking as much care, the, the accident rates went actually back up to where they were before. But what this did amongst uh, people working with transportation in Sweden was to uh, kind of introduce the understanding that the, this isn't just the cost of business doing business, this isn't just something we can accept, we can do something about it through education, through through physical measures, through, through uh, new regulations. And it, it's really the beginning of Sweden's work with um, what we now call a, 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 a systemic approach or a systematic approach to, uh, to traffic safety. And over the coming two decades, there was quite a quite a large reduction of um, accidents and deaths uh, in traffic. Uh, a lot of this is uh, enforcement. Some of it is um, new regulations being introduced. For example, the use of seat belts, um, how much alcohol you can drink before driving. Um, there's also a lot of innovation in vehicles around this, and we have, uh, or at least had, two uh, vehicle manufacturers in Sweden who are very advanced or very uh, progressive in their. Uh, um, uh, approach towards road safety. Volvo is still a, a world leader in road safety and uses it very much in its its marketing and its uh, its PR. Um, so quite a big uh, reduction as a result of uh, this uh, 1967 change where people saw that change was possible. Um, accidents rates started to stagnate a little bit around this time in the uh, kind of early 80s to, to, to mid 1990s and um, this kind of got people, uh, it, it created a lot of discussion that we'd had this this long period of uh, big reductions in traffic uh, deaths and injuries and um, it, it started to stagnate, traffic started to increase a little bit, um, people started to become more aware of the issue again. And this is kind of the background to the decision that was taken in the Swedish parliament that is today called Vision Zero. So the parliament decided effectively this, that uh, no one shall be killed or seriously injured within the road traffic system. It's a really simple, basic message. Uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, work that lies behind this, and a lot of text and a lot of uh, uh, decisions and discussions. But essentially, this is the uh, this is the uh, the core of Vision Zero from Sweden's point of view, that this is a, a decision made in the national parliament. It shall apply to all of us no one shall be killed or seriously injured in the, the road traffic system. It's, a, it's an ethical approach essentially to road traffic safety. The first response you usually get, and I think it was probably the first response when I first heard, heard about it, was, was that this is impossible. You can't come to zero because people make mistakes. People are going to make mistakes in traffic. There's nothing we can do about it. You can't eliminate people's uh, mistakes. And the answer to that is yes, that's quite true. People do make mistakes. But mistakes shouldn't be punishable by death. We need to adapt our roads and streets uh, to make sure that these mistakes that people are making don't lead to death or serious injury. There should be tolerance within the transportation system, within the road system, to allow for people to mis make mistakes without it uh, causing a serious problem. Another big change is to say that uh, it's road managers and road users who share this responsibility. Previously, it had been uh, the responsibility was on the individual. Now it's it's much more shared between uh, road users, but also 
we as public authorities who manage the road system. I think it's important to pause here a little bit and talk about um, some of the controversy around uh, Vision Zero, and th it is still quite controversial amongst certain people in Sweden. And I think this, a lot of this uh, comes out of there being at least two different ways to think about how we set goals and visions, in this case in the public sector, but basically in any kind of sector in your personal life within the, the um, any kind of industry, of course. Um, the way Vision Zero works, and let's call it the political approach to uh, goal setting, is that you set a goal, you say, this is not acceptable, you say, uh, zero people should be killed or injured in the road system. You say, uh, we will put a man on the moon by the end of this decade. You say, uh, nobody should live in poverty. You set a, a goal that gives a very clear direction where you want to go, and then you start to talk about trade-offs and priorities and compromise and what we need to do to get there and what we really mean and which what kind of com uh, goal conflicts there are. I think this is a, it's a quite common way of setting goals. It's a way that we've used quite a lot at the city council. Um, but there's a different school of thought, let's call it the economist's way of setting goals. Um, and that's where you start off with the discussion about trade-offs and priorities and compromise and say, yes, that's a lovely idea, but we have these goals as well. We have goals about accessibility. We don't want to reduce journey speeds so much that people can't get to where they're getting to in the time. That's, that's also a big cost. Um, we don't have the money to build, rebuild the entire road network. So you do the, the discussion about trade-offs and then you set a goal based on that. that, that how is this, what is a goal that is reasonable based on what we're prepared to spend? And I think like, a, as I've written here, the, the, the controversy about Vision Zero is very often about a, a conflict between these two different ways of setting goals. Neither is right or wrong, but it leads to quite difficult discussions. I, um, I would say there are people within my department who, uh, still think that Vision Zero is, is it's not quite the right way to set a goal. We should have had this discussion about trade-offs and priorities first and then set a goal rather than setting the goal and then having a discussion about trade-offs. But the Swedish Parliament decided that they would set this goal um, and as public servants we can think whatever we like but we have to do what the politicians decide. Um, no one should be killed or seriously injured in the road system um, and it actually leads uh, the, the a lot of kind of as I say, it's an ethical approach and a lot of different aspects fall out of that. These are just some of the ones that um, this organization Vision Zero Initiative, which is a, a number of public authorities within Sweden who've come together to, to, to market Vision Zero, uh, are saying some of the more important. It's, it's moving from a focus on accidents, there's that word again, um, to looking at fatalities and serious injuries. So it's not about reducing accidents or getting rid of accidents. It's about making sure people are not being killed and seriously injured in accidents. Um, we can't assume perfect human behavior. We have to assume that people are going to make mistakes and we need to integrate that into the way we're thinking. It's, as I said, moving uh, responsibility from individuals to, uh, to the system and the design. Um, and trying to get this, uh, th th this frame of mind from saving lives is expensive. Here it says saving lives is cheap. I would rather say that uh, not saving lives is very expensive. Allowing people to die and be seriously injured is extremely expensive for society. So Vision Zero uh, adopted in 1997 and has led to um, further reductions in uh, the number of deaths and injuries on the roads, uh, quite a steep reduction at the beginning that's kind of starting to uh, to plane off a little bit. And um, actors within the industry in Sweden or within the, uh, the, the sector in Sweden are starting to think about, we need to, uh, to kind of renew this uh, Vision Zero. We need a Vision Zero 2.0 to use the, the current jingo um, to kind of refresh the, uh, the, the approach that we're having. And I think a lot of the what lies behind that is that um, the concentration from the National Transportation Administration has been very much what this image is about. It's about making sure that we create these kinds of roads where you can't ever meet uh, in a head-on collision because you design the road in such a way that that's not possible. It's had a really, really good effect on a lot of country roads, but it is very country roads, kind of outside of the big cities focused, and that's kind of... I would say what Vision Zero has been for a lot of people in Sweden up to now, it's been a very non-urban um, focus from a national level, from individual cities, there's been a very strong focus on what we do in cities, but the, the national government and the National Transport Administration has not thought so much about that. So yeah, it's, it's been a, a very infrastructure-based um, 
creating these kinds of uh, it's called a two plus one road it's horrible I hate driving on them but they're, they're apparently much safer what they do do is uh, remove the ability for cyclists to cycle on country roads which is also rather controversial and uh, perhaps not quite the thing that we would like to be aiming at so turning to Stockholm we have uh, our own goals in the short term we subscribe to Vision Zero we are a part of the the national government network so we are ascribed to Vision Zero but we are setting goals on a shorter term basis, what what do we need to do on the way to get to zero? There are a lot, a lot of steps on the way there. And our latest uh, road safety plan is for the period 2010 to 2020, as you see here. And there our goal has been a 40% reduction in the number of uh, people killed and seriously injured. That's uh, KSI stands for. I don't know how much you use that in uh, other parts of the world. Um, the plan tries to identify what things uh, we should be spending, we should be prioritizing, we should be spending most time on. And it's a combination of what has the most impact and what things does the city have primary responsibility for. And there we identify three things. One is uh, managing speed properly. One is making sure our high streets are safer. And the third one is maintenance. Um, there's a number of other aspects you can see there around heavy vehicles, uh, around how we use local streets, around whether people are using seat belts around whether people are using cycle helmets to talk about another controversial area which I'm going to avoid completely um, and whether people are driving sober so not uh, affected by either drugs or alcohol. But these things are lower priority are in some cases because they're going to have less impact we think so for example what we do with local streets but also things that are not the city's responsibility we can't enforce seatbelt use we can't enforce uh, cycle helmet use or sober drivers that's something the police needs to do. So I said I'd talk a lot about data um, and data is getting the right data is really important for lots of reasons. Um, our data in Sweden is uh, centralized nationally and is collected in something called uh, the Swedish traffic accident data acquisition. There comes that word accident again. It's called Strada. Um, I'm going to give you a very quick course in Strada because it's kind of important. So uh, I hope you'll uh, stay with me. So Strada has two sources of data. One is from the police and the police data has been collected in a standard way since 2000 in the whole of the country. Um, the police are generally called to accidents when they involve motor vehicles. Um, so if uh, two motor vehicles collide with each other or a motor vehicle collides with um, a fixed object or with a person, um, generally you will call the police uh, because you need to decide if somebody is at fault, but also because you probably need that police report in order to claim on your insurance. Um, and that gives us a certain kind of information. It's it's legally required that you've, you you complete this information, and it's it, it's a very good source of information. But what we find is that we miss quite a lot of really important uh, data by only looking at police data. And since uh, around 2010, we've spent a lot of time trying to get good data for, also from hospitals. Um, Hospital data tends to reveal, and I'll come back to that, a lot more uh, incidents involving pedestrians and cyclists, because if I slip or trip on ice or I uh, come off my bicycle because the, the road is in poor repair, I don't call the police, I go to the hospital. So police data is very technical, it will tell us uh, what how the accident occurred. This is a, a, a genuine police report. We've taken out the, uh, the the personal data and nobody was seriously injured in this, this incident. But it will tell us what led up to an accident and will help us to understand, is there something with the road system, the road network that we could have used to prevent this? Uh, the police will make a, a judgment about injuries, but the, the police, they're on site, they're not uh, medically trained, so it's, it's not necessarily the best judgment. That we get much better from uh, hospital data. There we have... Um, medically trained people who are making uh, proper inspections of people and understanding um, how seriously they are injured. This is, uh, again, a genuine uh, hospital report. This person, again, was not uh, seriously injured. So we use Strada for lots of things. Strada gives us uh, data that we put in our traffic accident report, which is uh, sent to uh, the committee and is uh, published in the media and is, is, is helping basically the citizens to hold us to account. It's giving them information about what kind of accidents are happening, where are they happening. It gives them kind of the tools they need to help hold us as uh, a public authority to, count, to account. It uh, gives us a basis for priority. It allows us to see where are the best places, or where are the places that we should be spending our money, where there are lots of uh, incidents occurring, where should we be thinking about uh, trying to improve the road network. 
It allows us to answer questions from the media, from uh, again, who are holding us to account against this uh, this vision that's been set up, uh, from the politicians, from our colleagues who are rebuilding the road system or are doing uh, other kinds of uh, kind of urban and city planning. It gives a picture of the present present situation, where are accidents or, or uh, injuries occurring within the road network. Um, what kind of injuries are occurring where, again, to give us kind of a, a, an overall strategic picture of where it is we should be spending our money, where we should be uh, focusing our energies. It allows us to monitor our progress towards the goals that we have. Whoops. Uh, what happened there? Let's try that again. Sure. And of course I need to go through all those again. Bear with me. Yep, it allows us to monitor our progress towards our goals. It also allows us to measure the effectiveness of um, individual measures that we carry out. Um, this is an example where we have uh, started using a particular um, method for clearing snow and ice from cycle paths. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later, but uh, we need to be able to understand whether this is having a good effect or not. So we did some uh, measurements before the, the uh, or measurements we used. We look at data from before the uh, this uh, new system was implemented, and there you see we have uh, 93 uh, incidents that are, um, you'll have to trust me on my translation, that are connected to um, uh, kind of ice and snow on the on the uh, on the on the cycle path. Um, after we've uh, used our method, we now have 80 uh, accidents that can be directly related to uh, ice and snow. That's a reduction of 14%. Maybe it doesn't sound huge, but it's uh, a, a good way of understanding whether this uh, this uh, method we're using is having a good impact. How can we make this method better? How can we spread it to other parts of the city in order to uh, to have the effect that we want? Um, the hospital data is really interesting because it's uh, we're getting more and more data, which if you look at a graph like this, looks like we're getting more and more accidents. We're not, in fact, what we're finding is, or what we're seeing is that more and more accidents are, are coming into our data so we can get a much better uh, data set to work with. So this is showing uh, the number of accidents and injured people. Uh, accidents is the blue uh, column and no, injured people is the blue column, based upon accidents is the pink column. This is years. Um, it looks like uh, the number of accidents are increasing, and that looks like we're not getting towards Vision Zero at all. In fact, that's not the case. It's uh, because we are getting better data. So in 2005, we had data from just one hospital, this hospital called uh, Coes Huddinger. Um, and success successively, under the last uh, 10 years, we have been increasing the number of accidents, the number of hospitals who are giving us their data. Uh, so much more and more data is coming in. At the same time, the city population has increased around 20%. So there's probably more um, injuries and more accidents occurring just because there are more people out in the road network. But this increase that uh, you appear to see in this graph is not an actual increase. It's a, an increase in the, the data that we have available. And that's really important because it's, it's actually turned on its head how we make priorities. So before all this data was available, this was what the picture looked like. It, the, 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 um, the police data, as I said earlier, has a focus on vehicle crashes. So a lot more vehicle crashes show up than uh, crashes involving uh, or incidents rather or accidents involving uh, pedestrians or cyclists. What happens when this hospital data starts to appear is that turns on its head and we see actually uh, incidents involving both pedestrians and cyclists are a much more significant part of the, uh, the, the accident makeup than we'd ever realized before. It's changing quite a lot how we prioritize how we spend our money away from uh, spending money to uh, to uh, protect people who are driving or passengers in cars towards protecting people who are pedestrians and cyclists. There's a really interesting um, gender aspect to this actually as well because uh, we find that 75% of those people who are injured in single pedestrian incidents are women, whereas 75% of those who are injured in uh, uh, vehicle accidents are men. Um, this is partly to do with the way the different ways that men and women travel, but there could be other things behind this that we're not quite understanding at the moment. So we're in the middle of quite a big exercise to try and understand how we can incorporate, in this case, gender, but all kinds of uh, equalities aspects, all kinds of social sustainability aspects into the way that we work with uh, with accidents and accident data. So that's the data section over. It was lots of graphs. We got through it. I hope you're, you're still with me. Um, 
I'm going to take a bit of time to talk about speed because speed we see is the absolute most important uh, aspect of uh, at least um, um, crashes or collisions or incidents involving vehicles. So vehicles either crashing with each other or vehicles uh, hitting pedestrians or cyclists or uh, other road users. And we're in the middle of quite a large review of all our speed limits in Stockholm. Um, uh, the standard speed limit on most roads in Stockholm is 50. Um, the national government has rather cunningly actually said, we're going to get rid of 50 as a speed limit. So you need to decide whether it's either 40 or 60. And it's kind of forcing us to make this this, this decision about is this a, a road that is primarily for moving vehicles? Do we want it to be 60? In which case we need to put in some quite strict safety measures to separate away cyclists and, and pedestrians. Or is this a city street where we can have 40? In which case, how do we make sure that we maintain 40 as a, as a, as a reasonable speed limit? Um, I'm guessing a lot of you are quite familiar with uh, why speed is important and you've seen various uh, different versions of this graph. This is the, um, uh, oh, how do you say that in English? Krokvold's curve on the, the, um, the, the kind of the, it, it, it's showing you your risk of uh, being killed in an accident of different kinds depending on the speed of the vehicle. So this blue line is showing um, if you are a pedestrian and you are hit by a vehicle. Um, the purple line is showing if you are in a vehicle and that vehicle is hit on a side-on collision. The, the red line, if you are in a vehicle and you are hit on a head in a head-on collision, what is your chance of uh, surviving that accident or not surviving that accident, rather, depending on the speed that the vehicle is traveling at? Um, I like these kind of graphs. I think they, are, they say a lot. Um, personally, I like this kind of illustration better. Um, so this is, uh, again, to do a quick translation, it's... Um, it's saying uh, this, the, if you are sitting in a vehicle, the injuries that you will sustain um, if you uh, crash at 70 kilometers per hour are equivalent to falling six, from a six floor window. Um, if you crash at 50 kilometers an hour, it's equivalent to falling from a third story window. If you crash at 30 kilometers an hour, then it's equivalent to falling from a first floor window. I think it, it, for me, it brings home what this actually means much clearer than uh, these kinds of very technical graphs and things. But it's, it's uh, whatever visual works best for, for individuals is, uh, is always good, I think. So one of the main motivations for reviewing speed limits is to try and make it clearer for all road users what speed is appropriate on different streets. These four different uh, Stockholm streets or roads um, actually all have the same speed limit. They're all 50 kilometers per hour, but they all signal very, very different things. This uh, street at the top left, uh, I wouldn't dare to travel more than about 20 on it. The one uh, bottom right, maybe I could go, go up to 70, 80 without really feeling too too uh, too concerned. But they all have a speed limit of 50 kilometers per hour. Um, we think that's not really reasonable. We think people need to people who are driving shouldn't have to be looking at the speed limit sign to understand what the speed limit is. The road should signal to them what speed limit is reasonable and sensible and uh, and sustainable. So our speed review is really about trying to uh, trying to uh, to understand that. And to do that, we are using a national government method called Rett Farti Staden. Um, it's always good to use the word fart in, uh, in uh, English language uh, uh, connections. But fortunately, I've done a translation for you. It's uh, more or less the right speed in the city method. And it's, um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the method because I think it's really good, uh, particularly when you're working with uh, transportation, which is dominated by engineers. Um, it's about uh, it's a, a kind of very formalized method of looking at the street and determining what is a reasonable speed for that street and once you've determined the reasonable speed what do we need to do to achieve that so it starts with this uh, what's it called the, the the life room or the life space method it's defining different kinds of space within the city in this case as free room or free space so a, a pedestrian street would be free room uh, or is it transport space at the other end of the of the scale? That's like a motorway or a highway where there are no uh, um, pedestrians or cyclists. In the middle, there's kind of a range of things that we call mixed room. Uh, it's uh, what most city streets are, to be honest. It's it's uh, different kinds of space uh, shared between lots of different users. The method itself uh, employs this very simple uh, red yellow and green uh, system for what is good, what is less good or poor, and what is uh, low standard or low quality. So for example, in what we call an integrated free room, which is uh, a, a space where lots of pedestrians are there, but there are also some vehicles present. 
then walking speed is probably an appropriate uh, or, or is, a, is, a, is a good quality standard according to this method. Um, if you have 20 kilometers hour as your speed limit, then you have a less good standard. At the other end of the scale, if you have this integrated transport room, which is kind of, it's a highway, but there are some pedestrians, there's some kind of activity around. A good standard is if you're maintaining 50 kilometers an hour, less good standards if you're coming up to 60, 70. It's, it's a very simple method, so I'm sure you're kind of uh, understanding what it is I'm after. So in the method, there's a whole series of these kinds of relationships that you uh, you define the standard as green or yellow or red, depending on a, a, a very given set of standards. Um, so the first one that we looked at now is urban character, but you also look at access. How many people are walking? What are they doing there? What's their purpose? Um, how many people are on bicycles? How many people, how much goods are using motor vehicles? Uh, how many people are on buses? Um, are the emergency services using this route in order to access uh, where they need to get to? Um, the safety and security, one is about uh, actual road safety, the other is about people's feeling or perception of safety. Um, and environmental health, uh, environment and health uh, questions, is there an air quality problem here, is there noise, is there partic particle problems, these kinds of things. So you're, you're kind of building up a, 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 a spreadsheet essentially, and it, you do it in an, in an Excel model. Um, which at the end of the day or the end of the, the process looks, or actually not the end of the process, but the middle of the process looks like this. So for every section of street or every street, you have uh, a determination of whether the speed you have at the moment is, is uh, achieving a good or a less good or a poor standard. So you can go in and uh, play with these speed limits uh, until you get as many green or at least yellow uh, points on your um, scale as possible you need to eliminate the reds basically make sure that the the speed you are defining is good enough that it's achieving as many good things as possible making this balance between uh, lots of different uh, aspects lots of different goals that you have i think the great thing about this is that like i say it's it, it talks to engineers in their language it talks about safety but to engineers in a, in a language that they understand it's it's a method so that when uh, the public or politicians or the media come along and say, well, why have you have you set this uh, speed limit? We can take them through the method and explain we did it because we did this process and that doesn't mean it's right and we can still change it, but this is what the process says would be the best kind of speed. So at the end of the process, uh, this is a map of the south part of Stockholm and the speed limits that the process says we should have. Um, it's a bit of a mess. Um, uh, we need to have some kind of consistency so that you're not changing the speed limit every block or two so that people uh, uh, have, a, have a chance to understand what kind of speed it is that they need to be maintaining. So you do what's called a, a system check or a system, uh, um, a system adaptation, which in this case has resulted in, in these speed limits. Um, we've eliminated 50 entirely in this and we're looking at uh, the green streets are 30 kilometers per hour, the blue streets are 40 kilometers per hour, the orange streets which are essentially um, highway standard are at 60 kilometers per hour. We don't have anything higher than that in the city. In order to make sure people are actually maintaining these speed, li speed limits, we need to look at implementing physical measures. Uh, in the best of worlds, we would put in physical measures everywhere, um, uh, but physical measures cost money and we need to prioritize. And our prioritization is based on this uh, uh, assessment, more or less. We start off looking at places where lots of children are. So that's, yes, obviously schools, but also sports grounds, uh, playgrounds, um, stadiums, uh, sports centers, etc. Um, we look at places that have a high rate of crashes today where we we really need to be concentrating on getting the speeds down. We look at stretches of road that already have very poor speed compliance and we have very good measurements of, uh, of speeds, actual, actual speeds, not just speed limits um, the, the, the measured on the ground. Um, and also places where we see a large quality deviation according to this right speed in the city method. So lots of places where we're seeing uh, it, it, it's showing up as yellow or red in the uh, in this uh, this uh, spreadsheet assessment. Our catalogue of measures are probably stuff you're all quite familiar with, um, roundabouts or um, I can't think what you call them in North America, traffic circles, I guess, something like that. Um, uh, Consistent footway and cycle paths. So when it, when you turn a corner and uh, turn into a side street over a cycle path, the cycle path will maintain the same level. So you have to go up over a speed table to get through it. I'll show you a picture in a second. 
um, gateway treatments, things that are sy symbolizing something is happening here. You are moving from a highway speed road into a local road, so we have some kind of entry treatment that says, welcome to our neighborhood, here we drive slowly. Um, raised pedestrian crossings and, and, and securing, or getting the right speed at pedestrian crossings are a really, really important part of our, our work. Um, the only way you can assure the right, ensure the right speed at the pedestrian crossing is actually to put in some kind of physical measure that is, is raising the level of the street or is uh, narrowing the street. Um, traffic signals, um, traffic lights are, are not a, a safety measure, we say. It's, there's no way to guarantee that people will drive, will, will stop at red traffic lights. You can drive through a, a red traffic light as fast as you like. Um, as fast as you like, as fast as you choose, maybe. Um, Speed tables, speed bumps, uh, narrowing down to one lane of traffic so people have to wait for each other. We have a lot of bus, bus stops, for example, where we narrow the lane completely. There's just room for a bus, so everybody has to wait until the, everybody's got off the bus and crossed the road to where they're going to in order to pass. Um, chicanes, where you, you narrow the, the streets. And then bus speed cushions, which allow buses to maintain their speed but force everybody else to, uh, to slow down. Um, this is just an example of uh, some of the pilot areas that we are implementing these and that you can see the kind of distances that we're looking between uh, different kinds of uh, measures on different kinds of streets. I guess is more, more sense if you know these places. But um, So this is an example of the, uh, the measures we do. Uh, so if you are turning off this, uh, this main street to the left and into the local streets, you are having to, to kind of, uh, you're being slowed down by this speed table and lots of things that are signaling you don't have the priority here, somebody else does as a driver, this is priority for cyclists, this is priority for uh, for pedestrians. Um, this is an example of a, uh, what we call a bus, a bus cushion, it's really hard to say in English. Um, so this is a, it's a, it's a speed bump that is narrow enough that the bus can drive over it if it drives slowly enough without being affected. Um, this is actually a, a requirement from the bus drivers union who say that uh, driving over too many speed bumps in a bus is actually damaging to their uh, to their members, and there's there's some evidence to show that that's that is the case. So we're looking at this and other kinds of measures that means the bus has to slow down, yes, but it doesn't have any kind of uh, um, vertical deflection. But if you drive over this in a regular car, then you're going to have to drive over it. You're going to get this vertical deflection. It's going to force you to, uh, to slow down. Um, roundabouts are actually incredibly safe in terms of uh, forcing you to slow down as long as they are designed in the right way and as long as they have the right volume of traffic at, at certain kinds of traffic volumes, but also at certain certain kinds of design can actually increase uh, speeds but uh, at least don't achieve the uh, the reduction speed that we want they're not terribly uh, what my colleagues in the city planning department would call urban um, so you wouldn't want to put this downtown but in some in the, certain kinds of locations and certain kinds of environments they are they are very appropriate we think a uh, method of, uh, of of slowing down traffic and in this case uh, slowing down traffic so that you can use this pedestrian crossing in, a, in an appropriate way in a safe way um, just another example of a pedestrian crossing here, we've got both a, a narrowing of the street but also uh, these bus, bus cushions. I'm really going to have to uh, practice how to say that properly. Um, this is an interesting example of kind of uh, the 1960s, 1970s ideal of planning where we would uh, raise up the, uh, the pedestrians on bridges that go over the street. Of course nobody uses this bridge, everybody just runs across the street so in the end you have to put in a crossing and you have to make sure that crossing is safe. An example of a, a raised crossing, um, this is uh, something we would only put in where there are uh, not huge amounts of traffic. These uh, these cobblestones are very uh, um, effective at slowing down traffic, but they're also rather weak. So if you had lots of very heavy traffic here, then this would uh, begin to collapse quite quickly. And an example of a chicane, this is a, again on quite a, a, a low traffic street. Um, you need to be able to have, uh, okay, two, two vehicles can't meet here, they need to wait for each other. So you need to be able to have a, a, a relatively low level of traffic for this not to start uh, causing uh, quite serious uh, queues and delays. So we have three uh, kind of ongoing plans that we are um, uh, concentrating on. One is uh, looking around what we can do around school environments. And there we are both looking at a lot of the kind of uh, physical measures that we've been looking at now, but also doing things that we can 
help uh, parents to not, or parents or guardians to not uh, drive their children to school. Um, in the inner city, no one drives their kids to school, but in parts of the outer parts of Stockholm, uh, the levels of parents driving kids to school is quite high. So we're looking at things like um, walking school buses, which is what you're seeing an example of here in the top right, um, where one or two parents volunteer to uh, to walk everybody's kids from the neighbourhood to school, basically, and you walk around and pick up kids and by the end it looks like a school bus but everybody's walking so you can get like 30 40 kids all walking together with two or three parents um it's 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 a very sociable thing for the kids to do it's a very popular thing for the parents to do um but it also reduces the need to uh, or, the, or the need the desire the, the the wish for people to drive their kids to school we're looking at how we can make it uh, much easier to walk and cycle uh, to school we don't recommend that anybody cycles or walks to school on their own until they're about 12 13 i think but uh, uh, after that being able to provide uh, cycle parking um, and we do provide some drop-off spaces for kids going to schools but we try we try to make those as, as they're not next to the school entrance basically which is the the most uh, kind of the most sensitive environment we try to put them a few blocks away or a, a, a couple of hundred meters away we're also working a lot with behavioral measures and uh, it's a big cooperation with uh, children with teachers with parents with guardians it's it's become quite a big part of the school curriculum that uh, you talk about uh, it's it's not teaching kids to be scared of cars. It's quite the opposite. It's teaching kids um, what I say, um, teaching kids about city planning basically, and teaching teaching them how the city works and how we make decisions and who makes decisions and who should you speak to to get uh, to get the kind of decision you want. Um, there's actually a really good example of a school not far from here where um, the kids worked really hard on uh, trying to get uh, parents not to to drop their kids off right outside the school because they all understood that it created quite a stressful environment for the kids and they put up a, a big sign outside the school that says um, if you park outside the school I won't do my homework um, this kind of uh, uh, getting kids past the power I think is quite powerful um, we are spending a lot of time and effort at the moment on trying to make cycling a more attractive option. Uh, Stockholm is not Copenhagen. I know everybody says, oh, we're not Copenhagen, but uh, don't get the impression that Stockholm is some kind of Scandinavian cycling paradise. We are we're spending a lot of time trying to get better at it, but we're not quite there. We have some really good infrastructure. We have some terrible infrastructure that we've uh, inherited from uh, previous years, and we've got some places where infrastructure is missing completely. So we're looking at trying to get a, a complete network and a safe network, and in particular a network that is separated from, partly from uh, pedestrians, but also from cars. We've also got a, a pedestrian plan that we're in the process of rolling out, and a lot of that is around um, actually not necessarily just safety but a lot about security a lot about making the the street environment feel more secure making people feel more confident more um that they've got the information they need in order to be able to get where they need to go to and that they um that, yeah they feel confident walking basically um we're looking at how we can be much much better at measuring the number of pedestrians things that get counted count more in uh, in transportation there's no use pretending otherwise so finding better methods of of uh, measuring how many pedestrians are using our streets, how many people want to walk, how many people would walk if there was a better opportunity for them to walk. Um, our city plan is quite famously, I think, called the walkable city, uh, Promenade Staden. And I think we there's a lot we still need to do to walk to live up to that. Uh, Stockholm is a very walkable city if you're in the, the inner city area. As soon as you start getting out to some of the suburbs built in the 1950s, 1960s, around this kind of modernist ideal, um, it's very walkable as long as you stay in your neighbourhood. But if you want to walk to the next neighbourhood, it's not necessarily quite so straightforward. Well, we're talking about pedestrians. Uh, it's a good opportunity to talk about this maintenance issue. I said earlier that um, uh, when we look at hospital data, we see that actually uh, uh, pedestrian single person injuries are quite a big part of the uh, the, the serious injuries that are happening in our city and um, in a city like Stockholm uh, pedestrian this, uh, this pedestrian injury question is very much a winter maintenance issue so this graph you're looking at now is uh, the number of uh, traffic injuries in total uh, if you uh, put together all these different uh, colors in the in the charts across the year the dark green uh, element of that is single pedestrian accidents and that means people slipping it means people tripping it means uh, nobody else was involved in the accident but the probably something with the the street environment was not how it should be and uh, people have been injured 
it's a winter maintenance problem. It's it's snow and ice basically. Um, we did a couple of years ago an assessment of what this is actually costing in terms of uh, lost work time for people. Uh, what it's costing in uh, um, uh, kind of hospital bills, what it's costing for elderly people not to dare to go out of their house so other people are going to have to go shopping for them, provide for them. Um, it's, it's a huge cost to society basically. We uh, estimate that it's around 500 million Swedish crowns. Um, I've translated that to Canadian dollars so I don't know how many Canadians are listening but it's, it's not the absolute number that's the interesting thing is the relation to what we spend on snow clearance. So we spend about 200 million uh, Swedish crowns a year on snow clearance, but the cost of these pedestrian injuries is 500 million crowns a year. So if we can increase that budget, if we can motivate increasing that budget, then we can we can show a, a clear uh, um, societal benefit because these costs of 500 million crowns, yes, some of them are being borne by individuals, but a lot of them are being borne by society and the healthcare system and the social care system. So manage, management and maintenance, uh, which for maybe 10, 15 years ago was not a huge part of traffic safety, has become a really, really important part of our traffic safety work, and in particular looking at uh, improved wind, winter maintenance. But it's kind of all year round. It's about removing uh, leaf fall in the autumn. It's about uh, making sure we, at this time of year in the spring we remove the sand and gravel that we use to... Uh, to to uh, to make the icy surfaces less of a problem, uh, removing those as quickly as possible. If you've ever tried cycling on gravel, you know that it's a really big safety issue. Um, but also uh, using the power of Stockholmers to to do problem reporting. We have around 3,500 streets in Stockholm. Uh, there's only 350 of us in the transportation department. We can't keep track of what's happening in all of these streets. So we're using this uh, a mobile phone app called Ticktill. Uh, tell us what you think more or less to, to, to make it easy for people to, to report problems. So you can go into this app, um, take a picture, give us a GPS location, give us a really simple, this is a really bad uh, patch of ice, fix it. And then we've got this, this information and we can't always send someone out to fix it immediately, but it allows us to make a proper prioritization. This is our, our current pride and joy. It's the, uh, um, the ooh, what do you call that in English? So something. Um, it's like a it's a it's a form of snow clearance on in this case bike paths, but can also be used on on footways. And basically, this brush at the front is brushing away the snow. Uh, the tank at the back is uh, spreading a, a salt solution, a brine solution, which is ensuring that essentially, given the right uh, salt solution and the right temperature, uh, um, yeah, the right air temperature. It's going to give you more or less summer conditions on uh, winter cycling routes, and it's uh, we're partly using it because we want more people to cycle in winter, because that's when we need to uh, to reduce the pressure on both the road network, but in particular on the public transportation network. And we've seen uh, winter cycling rates increasing enormously because, thanks to this machine, basically, it's not just one; we have several, of course. Um, but it's uh, being a snow clearer on a uh, for a city transportation department is not always the most popular job. These guys uh, they get so much credit from cyclists, people thanking them, hugging them, giving them chocolates and flowers and all sorts of things because it's it's making such a huge impact on the ability for people to cycle and walk in winter who maybe would never have dared to previously. And it's it's having a huge safety impact. We're already seeing. Um. Information and knowledge, I think, is it's it's a very internal focused thing, but I think is is it's really been really important for us. I talked a lot about data at the beginning. I'm not going to apologise for that because I think it's been really important for us in helping us to 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 make the right priorities, helping us to prove that things that we are doing are having a good impact, um, helping us to persuade some of my colleagues who were maybe a bit sceptical that we can do these things, it doesn't have to cost a huge amount of extra money. The impact we get, the uh, reduction of costs in other parts of society is quite significant. Um, so just having that data, having this analysis, having these before and after studies have been really, really important. Um, but also using that information to, to feed back knowledge to people within the organization and to help them to understand how important the job that all of us are doing is. Um, one of the really perhaps most popular, most successful elements of that has been what we call insight education. And it, um, it sounds really stupid and looks a little bit silly because we are taking people out on the street and, and uh, simulating visual impairments, simulating um, physical impairments, simulating her the hearing impairments. Here we see people on a, on a, these are some of my colleagues on a city street, uh, 
this is in in uh, in good conditions. We take the people who are responsible for snow clearance out in this kind of way when there is snow on the ground and get them to understand what what difference it makes if the snow has been cleared properly and if the snow hasn't been cleared properly, how it affects the uh, the quality of life of people who are perhaps not as uh, mobile as as the rest of us. So I'm nearly done. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, to summarise, um, so Vision Zero is a it's an ethical approach to road safety. It says very clearly no level of death or serious injury is acceptable. This is um, it's not entirely uncontroversial. I think it's important that we we acknowledge the controversy and uh, kind of meet the people who have trouble with that in in a good and appropriate way. But it does require that we adapt the road network in particular, but also the way we think, the way we work as organizations, the way we maintain the road network, the way we talk about safety. Um, I think very strongly that we need comprehensive data to make the right priorities. And I think if all you're using is data from uh, police crashes, then you're probably not making entirely the right priorities. Um, it, it's really good data and it's very important, but it only is telling us part of the story. And as I say, this getting good hospital data has changed our image of what the safety problem is altogether. It's made us change our concentration much, much more towards um, towards uh, pedestrians, towards cyclists. Um, speed is a really, really important factor and we need to do things that are ensuring the right speed. I'm not saying you need to use the same method as we do, but I'm saying this method that we use is very powerful because it kind of gives a, a methodical, slightly uh, appearance of an engineering solution. But as always, it's really important that you're getting the basics right. So uh, I say always to my colleagues in the uh, city planning department, um, there's basically nothing that we transportation planners can do to fix things that aren't right in the first place. And we need, as always, to be making sure we are building and designing and enabling dense mixed use neighborhoods. We're planning for walkability and cyclability. Um, we're providing attractive transit so that you don't need to drive. And we're managing demand in particular for uh, for transportation, for, for road transportation in uh, peaks and in locations when uh, demand is very high. Um, there's a lot to say. I could have spoken for about four days, I think, but there's a huge amount of um, resources out there on the internet. This particular site is run by the um, uh, this network of uh, public authorities I talked about. Um, so if you go in there, you will find uh, kind of uh, ready presentations, you'll find films, you'll find all kinds of information, you'll find a number of companies trying to sell their services. You can ignore that if you like. That was all I had. Thank you.